So, welcome everybody for this monthly All of Us seminar. Today we have the chance and the privilege to receive Roman Frigg from LSE on representation. And after a short break, after a start, there will be a, a, a short break and a, a short comment from Quentin Ruin from Com Complu Com oh, Complutense. Complutense University. Madrid. Roman, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And as a, the title slide says I'll be talking about scientific representations. So this is joint work with my colleague James Nguyen, who, uh, who was in Notre Dame for a while, but is in Stockholm now. And what I'll be saying is mostly based on this book here that came out in the middle of the pandemic, so probably no one noticed, um, modeling nature, in particular chapters eight and nine. But parts of the talk are also based on my most recent book called Models and Theories, just came out a few months ago. And this has at least one thing to recommend it, namely that you get it for free. So it is open access and you can just download it from the publisher's website and it's obviously linked up on my personal website, so you just click the button there. Well, it's probably carrying calls to Newcastle here in this audience, but still um, to make my starting point <coughs> clear, so I just take this, this simply scientific fact that models matter as my starting point, so there is hardly a scientific achievement that did not involve a model in one way or another. Just think about planetary motion, the theory of heat, the statistical mechanics of gases, nuclear and atomical structure, DNA structure, the Higgs boson, and so on and so on. And this obviously throws you back to the question of what is a model. So now I do what the modern scholar does. You hack your question into Google and <laughs> On the first page, you find this thing here um, that says a scientific model is a representation of a particular phenomena in the world. And that's not bad as a definition, although we will, I will qualify that in the talk. But I use this as a motivator for the question I'm really concerned with, namely, just what is representation? So, so that's what I want to talk about. And I called my talk representing representation because I'm obviously not the first to ask this question. There's a number of accounts available. So there's conventionalism of various kinds, similarity accounts, isomorphism account, inferentialism, and direct fictionalism and the Deki account. And so for all of these here, I would refer you to the book. I'm not taking you through all this, I mean, we would never get out of this room at the useful time. And what I want to do is focus on the Decky account. And this is a slightly cryptical name, but you will understand a bit later what the acronym means. Just when I started working on this, suddenly a friend of mine sent me this photo here and said, you, you, you've already got fans. And I said, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> so obviously people get personalized number plates. So uh, here we go. At least someone seems to like the account or can at least be interpreted as doing so. Anyway, it's a very liberal interpretation. <laughs> So before I delve into the details, I want to give you a preview. So I want to tell you what the Decky account is. And this is sort of encapsulated in this diagram. So you have this big box here called M. That's the model. And the model has an internal structure that consists of an object X, an interpretation, and then I will explain what I mean by that. That gives you a so-called Z representation. The model denotes a target system T. The model exemplifies certain properties P1, P2, and so on. These properties are connected with a key to an other set of properties, and these are imputed to the target system. And now, sort of the, what I had grayed out here is basically a linguistic part. So D stands for description, 
And so what you have on that side here is just you have a model description, you have a description of the interpretation, you have a description of the object, and obviously a description of the target. So that is just to recognize that this will play a role in some context, that our models don't live in sort of a language-free space, but they're usually introduced and studied in a particular language. Now, if all this is sort of a bit bit abstract to make sense of. Here is a concrete example. So take a, a model of the solar system. So you start with an object here. This is spheres that attract each other gravitationally. You interpret these spheres in terms of uh, the sun and planets. That turns this sort of object into a solar system representation that model exemplifies certain properties, for instance, that planets move in elliptic orbits. That property is keyed up, and again, I will say more about keys later. This is really just to give you the panorama of what we're going to talk about this hour. Uh, if, with another property, namely that planets move in an ellipsoid. So this is something that's somewhat like an ellipse, but not quite, and that's impute, imputed to actual planets. And you obviously you do this using all kind of descriptions that are formulated in a particular language. So that gives us the plan. I want to explain what motivates this uh, our particular way of thinking about models and representations. I want to explain to you how we get there because there's a lot of boxes and, and, and concepts flying around. So why should one think about it in this way and how do we get there and I want to flesh out details. Now in doing so you immediately run up against a problem, namely there seem to be two different kinds of models, at least from an ontological point of view. So one are concrete objects. These are physical things you can put on the table. We'll talk more about this funny object later. Does someone recognize this? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about it. Yeah. Is, is it the water model from, from your paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never seen a picture of it. Yeah. I've only read you writing about it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's the Philips Newlin machine. And I'll show you a video of it later. So oh, you cool. see it in action. So that's a physical thing. It's about two and a half meter high and a meter and a half wide. And it rattles and pumps. And uh, it's really quite interesting to see. And then on the other hand, you have obviously sort of non-concrete models that Ian Hacking sort of nicely described as something that you hold in your head rather than in your hands. And many models are of that kind. I mean, when you do the Bohr model of the atom, you, you have nothing to put on your table. So you, you're sort of caught in this. And I was deliberately vague about this just in the previous slide when I showed you this sort of solar system object here. So we have to pay some attention to that. So the updated plan then for the talk is that I want to first talk about representing with material models, so things like the Philips Newlin machine, because a lot of things that I want to say are more naturally said about physical things than about non-physical things. But in the second part, I want to tell you how this um, carries over so you don't get any kind of representation that only works for rattling water pumps. Um, this should work for all models. but. Most work will be in part one, so don't, don't get nervous if I'm half an hour in and still there, because the idea is that most of it um, carries over to non-material models in a relatively straightforward way, and I will tell you how this goes. Okay, part one then, representing with material models. And I want to start with some background here. And the background here is the theory of representation as that's been developed by Nelson Goodman and Catherine Elgin. And sort of the Decky account is really sort of a sequel to this, if you think about it this way. It is a, a de further development of, of that account. And therefore, it's helpful to go over that account first and then I tell you where different pieces are changed, <coughs> inserted, and, and improved. So representation as is something you're familiar with 
from uh, caricatures. So here is a classic so Margaret Thatcher represented as a boxer. So that's a warm-up example for what representation as would mean. Or if that's a bit too far back for your taste, so here's a more recent one. Although, I mean, one can't update these things quickly enough. So, I mean, that's already the past too. But uh, so here is Liz Truss as a puppet on strings. It's also a case of representation as. But I'm obviously interested in scientific models at the end of the day. So here is one. Now you may think that this is sort of my feeble attempt at making props for a horror movie, but no. This is the stuff of Nobel Prizes. So uh, that's uh, myoglobin represented as a plasticine sausage. And research on that model won Kendra the Nobel Prize in 1963 for myoglobin structure. And this is the one I've already shown you. So this is so the Guatemalan economy represented as a system of pipes. And I'll come back to that, as I said. So here's a bit of notation. In what follows, I'll use x as the variable denoting the object that does the representing. And that may sound a bit roundabout, but there's various objects that can do representing. They can be machines, plasticine, sausages, drawings on paper. So whatever is doing the representing in the case that you're interested in, that's X. Then T is the target system in the world. That's the thing represented. Either some unfortunate politician or myoglobin or the Guatemalan economy. So I hope that these two are sort of intuitive enough. The next on the list is one that needs a bit more explaining and I come to that. So the Z is the kind of the representation. In the caricature, the beginning, this would be the boxer, for instance, so because the, the caricature with Thatcher would be a boxer representation. And so, so that's the third element of the account. Now here is what Catherine Elgin says about representation. She says, when X represents T as Z, this is because X is a Z representation that denotes T as it does. X does not merely denote T and happen to be a Z representation. Rather, in being a Z representation, X exemplifies certain properties and imputes those properties to or related ones to T. Now, I don't expect you to digest this immediately. I will spend the next 15 minutes disentangling that. And to help us with this, I made a graphical representation of this. So we have X, that's the object that does the representing, and that is also a Z representation that denotes the target system, that exemplifies certain properties associated with Z, and it imputes these on the target system. So with the, with the Thatcher caricature that works as follows, the caricature is a boxer, representation. It denotes Margaret Thatcher. It also exemplifies certain properties that one would associate with boxers, like being brutal, being ruthless, being aggressive, something along those lines. And it imputes these to Margaret Thatcher. So that's how representation as on the Goodman and Elgin account works. And here's again the general scheme. And now we have to do some work. So we have to explain what a Z representation is, which is, I hope you have some intuition from the examples I showed you, but we have to say a bit more. We should say something about denotation, and we have to say something about exemplification. And that sort of sets the agenda here. Okay, let's get started. Let's start with denotation. Now, denotation is the two-place relation between a symbol and the object to which the symbol applies. I mean, you're all familiar with that. The paradigmatic example here is some um, proper names. So, for instance, the name Louvala Neuf refers to this town here. And the crucial point here is that denotation is the core of representation. So, the representation is the representation being about. <coughs> the target system and the aboutness of the representation is given to us by 
the representation denoting the target session. And Goodman and Elgin say that X is a representation of T if and only if X denotes T. And the crucial preposition here is sort of off, uh, because uh, I start by saying I give you an account of representation as. And so these little, little prepositions matter. So this is representation of, which will be a part of representation as, but obviously representation as will be more. And there's also an important caveat here, namely that denotation presupposes existence. So only something that exists can be denoted. Now this has an immediate consequence, namely that things like pictures of unicorns do not denote anything at all because there are no unicorns and so the consequence is that pictures of unicorns are not representations of anything at all. Now that is a somewhat counterintuitive consequence. So recently that seen in the London Underground there's a lovely flock of unicorn running through a shallow lake and that's an ad for, for an energy company trying to sell you an energy account. Um, surely that company didn't choose the flock of unicorn because the picture represents nothing at all. So, so what are we to make of this? So how do we <coughs> square the view that this is not a representation of anything with the fact that this obviously has some representational content? And this is where an important move happens, and that goes back to Goodman's Languages of Art. And so there Goodman says, we're misled into believing that something is a representation only if there is something in the world that it represents. So we have to distinguish between a picture of a unicorn, the of here again, and a unicorn picture, which is an unbreakable predicate indicated by the hyphen here. Or more generally, a representation of a Z or a Z representation. And what we have in the unicorn case is, of course, that this is a unicorn picture, but it's not a picture of a unicorn. And these are two modes of representation that you have to keep separate. One does not imply the other. Some Z representations denote the Z and others don't. And some representations of a Z are Z representation and others aren't. At this point, you sort of may secretly think this is just a the trickery of this philosopher's having a bit of fun here. Uh, but I, I, I want to now try to convince you that this is actually a helpful distinction in trying to make sense of, of many images that we are very familiar with. You know that. That is a map of Europe and we can say this is a territory representation that portrays a territory and it is also a representation of a territory namely of Europe. So this is a simple case in which they, they coincide. This is both a set representation and the, rep and the representation of a set. But now look at this here. Someone recognize that? Any fans of TV shows in the house? Yeah, sorry. Sorry? No. That's yeah. Game of Thrones. Yeah, so that's the world according to Game of Thrones. <laughs> so <coughs> I hope you would agree with me um, that this is a territory representation, just as the map of Europe before was, but it's not a representation of a territory, because there is no such thing as the world of Game of Thrones. It, 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 it's, of course, an imaginary construct. So you see that we can have a territory representation that's not a representation of a territory. Well, look at this here. So that's a slightly personalized version of a map, sort of the British Isle, uh, sorry, the language, farting down ships towards France. Um, I would say that this is a territory representation, but not a representation <laughs> of a territory. It's a representation of national attitudes and military ambitions, probably. Sadly, this goes back to James Gilray in 1793, and when he sort of tempted to say something's never changed, but 
Uh, there we go. So he, here's another case of a of a of a unit representation that's a, a z representation, but not a representation of a z. And now look at this. It's the word Europe. That's clearly a representation of Europe because the expression denotes Europe, but it's not a territory representation. So here we can now sum up what we have. In the vertical you have whether something is, is a Z representation or not, and in the horizontal you have whether something is a representation of a Z or not, which yes, yes, is the map of Europe, no and yes, it's Game of Thrones and the caricature, um, something that's a representation of, but not a set representation, is the word Europe. And if something is neither one nor the other, then it's just a mere object, like this glass here, that has no semantic function at all. So I hope I have convinced you at least that this is <coughs> not just sort of philosophical trickery to make this distinction and that something useful could come out of it. But now you you will ask immediately, okay, what makes something a Z-representation? I've just put up these images and said, that's a boxer representation, or that's a territory representation. And that's a very good question, and I will come back to it later. Now, in, in the context of visual representations, that has sparked a huge literature. Entire PhDs are written on it. But boiling it down to essential, I think one can say there, there are two accounts. One is perceptual accounts. Let's say a picture X is a Z representation if, under normal conditions, an observer would see a Z in X. For instance, uh, Lopez is a proponent of this account. Or um, Goodman and Elgin have their own accounts, it's the genre accounts of pictures belong to certain genres and are recognizable as such. We just do recognize territory representations because we're familiar with the genre. Now, I don't want to get into this because neither of these accounts, whatever their intrinsic worth in their domain, they don't work for scientific models. I mean, they're just not, not going to help us. Um, so I would ask you to keep operating with an intuitive notion of what a Z-representation is for another 15 minutes or so. And then I give you an account of what this would mean in scientific case. Okay, let's sum up. That, that's our graph we had initially. So we've shed some light on the notation of the set representation. Now we have to say something about exemplification. Now why do we want exemplification? Before getting into it, I want to tell you what motivates getting into it. So what we really want to understand scientific models is that models are objects with an internal structure. So they're not like words, so you, you can twist and turn the word louval la neuf um, as long as you want. You won't learn anything about the city that it denotes. Um, but models are not like this. Models must be objects that have, have properties, and these properties are important in their representational function, and we want to understand how this works. And that's essentially the problem to which exemplification answers. Or Rick Hughes has this nice phrase where he says, models are objects that have an internal structure. They have a life, an internal life of their own. And but that's what we have to understand. So exemplification, you're all familiar with that. You want to paint your living room. You go to a paint shop and you sort of show and paint samples. And you, you choose the color you want to use to paint your room. Now this uh, paint samples or paint swatches you have here, they represent by exemplifying their own color. So that's an example of representation by exemplification. Now what does that mean? Intuitively an item exemplifies a property if it represents by instantiating the property. And one can sort of coin a formula here and say exemplification is possession plus reference or instantiation plus reference. And if you want examples beyond that, I mean samples of all, all kinds are, are examples for this sort of um, 
this kind of representation. If you go to the market and you try the cheese before you buy it, the little bit of cheese, you get this cheese sample and that represents by exemplification because the sample both instantiate the flavor of the cheese and it represents the flavor of the cheese. I'd notice that lexicographical signs <coughs> don't um, do this, so words don't have that property. The word London doesn't instantiate any properties that you would associate with the city of London. Yeah, excuse me, I think that uh, it, you, you should say it by instantiating the same property. Because uh, uh, drawings, for example, they instantiate properties. Yeah. And uh, uh, some properties of, of, of Margaret Thatcher are exemplified by, by, the, by the, the drawing, but some properties uh, of the drawing do not correspond. Uh, yes. Of, of You've just Some of them do, but not... Uh, You've just uh, the anticipated property. the slide, yeah. So, it's sameness, but mm -hmm. the I think that's exactly the point you're making, thank you, is that exemplification is selective, in the sense that exemplification implies instantiation, but not vice versa. So not, as you said, not, not every property that is instantiated is also exemplary. So exemplification is highly selective. So now take again our color swatches. They exemplify their colors, but they don't exemplify the geometrical shape. The thing could be round, and it would still do the same thing. So rectangularity is not represented here. Um, so exemplification is selective. And the selection, a lot can be said about how this happens, but basically it's a function of the context. So if you've shown this in a paint shop, it's obvious that the, the swatches exemplify color. If I somehow nick it and bring it to geometry class and hold it up and say rectangle, then it may come to exemplify rectangularity, but it doesn't do that in the context of the, of the paint shop. Distorted rectangularity. Sorry? Distorted rectangularity. They can distort as well. I will come to that later. So, so far it's really the same, same property. So a certain, certain shade of red is exemplified and it represents exactly that shade of red. But this is exactly a point I want to relax later on. So again, you, you see how this answers to what I said before. We want an internal structure. So you can study the paint sample, the paint swatch, and you also have Exemplification requires epistemic access. You can look at the color swatch. If the color swatch is too small to see, then it's simply not a color swatch. Mm -hmm. And um, that sort of gives you the epistemic access to properties that you want in scientific models. Again, coming back to the entire diagram here, so we now also have said what exemplification is, and so we have the whole thing in place. Once again, you had this already, but just to see how it works. The caricature, that's a boxer representation, <coughs> it denotes Thatcher, it exemplifies the properties and it imputes these to her. Okay, so far for Goodman and Elgin, that's the background. Now we want to apply this account to scientific representations. And okay, the first move you make is just you take the caricature out of it and you stick the scientific model in. So that's what you, what you want to do. So you would get something like the Phillips Newlin machine is an economy representation that denotes the economy of Guatemala. It exemplifies certain properties like, for instance, there being an anti-correlation of interest rates and inflation, and it imputes these to the Guatemalan economy. Just quickly, why do I pick Guatemala. It's not just because I always wanted to go on holiday there. But, um, so when we researched this paper, we really followed up on, record, uh, on minutes and reports from central banks. And then, of course, central banks are notoriously secretive about what they do. So it was a time when basically every central bank had one of these machines. The Bank of England had one, and the National Bank of New Zealand had one, and so on. But the, um, the Guatemalans are the only one who have gone on record as actually using it for policy making for, 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 for their economy. So they, they were quite open about this. I don't know, maybe the Bank of England did too, but they just don't, don't tell us. So, but that's why we, we picked with the case of Guatemala, because then we know that it's actually be used in this way. 
But now we have a bit of explaining to do. Well, what does it mean to say that this thing is an economy of representation? I mean, what exactly are we asserting here? How does that thing exemplify property like the being an anti-correlation between interest rates and inflation? And what does it mean to impute these properties to the Guatemalan economy? And so that's what we have to explain now. Now let's turn to Z representation in science. And so the question here really is, what turns this thing here into an economy representation? And the answer, James and I think, is that it is given an interpretation. We interpret water pipe properties in terms of economy properties. And that gives us the Z representation. And rather than arguing for this in the abstract, I want to show you how the machine actually works and someone commenting on it. Yep. So I'm going to try and do some calculations, some actual calculations, to make some predictions and see if we can get the right answer. Um, but I'll just close some things down. Put taxes. Balance the budgets. Now I'm going to try and do some very simple calculations today and what I'm essentially going to do is shut down the foreign sector completely. I'm just going to close all the valves down here and we'll just concentrate for a moment on the banking sector and the government sector. Well really the banking sector is what we're really going to look at today and see if we can um, do some predictions, do some calculations. Now this is one of the... Um, The big advances, big advances that Phillips made, and I'm not an economist, but I'm told that there were quite a bit of disagreement between Keynes and Robertson about exactly what it was that set interest rates. And apparently if the pair of them had lived to see this, they would have looked at Phillips' solution to this, and they would never have argued. <coughs> um, essentially it's treated it like a... Um, a stock. The one of the clear things about this machine is the way it makes a clear distinction between what's a stock and what's a flow. So you've got a big stock of money at the bottom, there's a stock of money here in the back, there's a stock of money held abroad in the foreign exchange, and everything else is a flow. And so it's, it's the supply. And I'm going to try and do some calculation. Okay, so I, I stop it here so, so you get the gist of this. So here's this guy standing in front of this water tank and saying, so here's the foreign sector. There's money in the bank, this is the treasury, and so on. And I think that's exactly what happens. So you have an object X that has certain X properties. In this case, this is a water pipe system that is, has hydraulic properties. Um, then we have a domain that we're interested in. Here, um, and that's an economy. And what happens is, in an interpretation, you just pair up X properties with Z properties. And one can refine this indefinitely, I guess, but at the basic level what happens is you pair up sortal properties with other sortal properties, like having a central bank is paired up with, with having a big water tank in the middle, <laughs> um, or um, having a foreign sector is paired up with um, having a certain part of the on the right hand side of the machine and then mass terms are also equipped with a mass correlation function. There was a lot of talk of money and whenever there was money at stake he pointed to, to water and so the amount of water is correlated with the amount of money. You can just say one litre of money corresponds to one million of the model currency or whatever you want to say here. So. That's effectively what you do, and that then allows you to say that in a given time interval, for instance, five million of the model currency flew through a certain, uh, uh, flown through a certain bank. So now we are equipped to give a definition of a set representation. A set representation is a pair x i, where x is an object like that water pipe system you've seen and I is an interpretation and now I'm going really out on a limb I'm giving you a definition of a model 
I would say a model is simply a Z representation where X has been chosen by a scientist or a scientific community to be a model. So that is what a model is. I mean, in the scientific context. I mean, I know for logicians that's something different. But I mean, in the kinds of models I'm talking about, that's why I started saying I'm interested in scientific models. So that is the definition. Now, some of you will immediately be tempted to cry foul and say, well, that doesn't require, tar require a target system. And yes, that's a conclusion I want to embrace. So being a model does not require a target system. And I will say more about this later. So this is not just a remark I make in passing. But that is exactly what we should say. And so we see that the Google definition was almost correct. So a model is not just a, her a representation full stop. It is a Z representation. So we qualify it in this way. So this is the example we have seen that, that already in the video. This Philips Newlin machine becomes an economy representation if it's described as a water pipe object and water pipe properties are correlated with the economy properties. Notice that nothing forces this on you. You could be interested in the education system and be interested in how students flow through an education system. You can take the same machine and interpret the amount of water as the number of students and then turn this into an education system <coughs> interpretation by, ch sorry, representation simply by changing the interpretation here. So none of these choices are in, in, in any way intrinsic to the objects themselves. So now we can start building up the general account and we start building up that diagram that I had at the beginning in the preview. So we see the model is the object X with an interpretation, or sometimes we call it an OZ interpretation because it's the object of the Z. And uh, that makes the model. Now that model can denote the target system in some cases. Sometimes the Phillips Newlin machine was used to denote, say, the Guatemalan economy. Sometimes it, it, it doesn't. And that can also involve part-part denotation. So this you can also, it's not the case that only the whole, the, the whole model denotes the whole target. You can obviously have part-part denotation. That's perfectly fine. And that's sort of subsumed. And I take it that we've said what denotation is, and we leave it at that for the moment. So now, what about exemplification? You recall, exemplification requires instantiation. But now we're sort of in a little pickle here, because we want to say something like that the machine instantiates economy properties, but water pipes don't instantiate economy properties. So that seems to be a category mistake. But that seems to have an easy solution because we can introduce the notion of an instantiation under an interpretation. So if we interpret water as money, we can say the, machine, the, the economy uh, that's represented in the model has a million euros there if it has a little water there. And that is perfectly good to ground exemplification claims. So we can then say I exemplification is I instantiation plus reference. And I mean, there's absolutely nothing deep here. This is just philosophical housekeeping. So we're not saying inconsistent six. So we understand what that arrow here means. So the model can I exemplify particular Z properties. But now we call that image again. So we then just said, these properties are just imputed to the um, target of the representation. Now, in scientific context, <coughs> it's too simple. So scientific models don't usually portray their targets as having exactly the same features as the model itself. And hence, the properties exemplified by the model are not the same as the one that are imputed to the target. So we need to. Um, transform these properties somehow. And the job is done by what, what James and I call a translation key. And to introduce that idea, I want to take you to a familiar example, namely maps. 
So this is a map of Switzerland. And so just imagine for the sake of the example, this is as an old fashioned a paper map that you have in front of you on your desk. You can measure distances on it. So I measure that the distance between the top and the bottom is 22 centimeters. Uh, that's a property that is exemplified by the maps because and distances are important for maps. But obviously you would have misunderstand the representation if you saw that the, the map says that Switzerland is 22 centimeters from north to south. I mean, the, the, I mean the place is small, but it's not that small. So um, something else has to happen. Now likewise with the dot that has written Chur on it, you can't really see this, it, it, it's somewhere here denoting the location of the city of Chur, which is in a yellow area. Now, you shouldn't infer from that that the city of Chur is yellow. Um, so the properties imputed up to the target are that the north-south extension is 220 kilometers and the city of Chur is 600 meters above sea levels. And so there is a conversion taking place, and that's given to you by the legend, or sometimes the key of the map, because you just look at what, what scale the map is. So you look up, am I at the bottom or on the back, what the color codes mean. And so that motivates the introduction of the notion of a key. So when you need other, for the more scientific examples, I start with something simple. You use litmus paper to see how acidic a solution is. So. Um, at some point the property, the paper exemplifies property P is red, but you don't want this, you want, the litmus paper doesn't tell you the solution is red, the litmus paper tells you that the solution is acidic. So you effectively, that representation comes with a key that translates colors into acidity levels, and usually you get a nice sort of a cardboard box where you get all the shadings and you just hold it to it. Or you can have a tolerance threshold, so the model can be plus minus 5%. Or well, there can be various limit relations, James and I discussed this in a paper. Or simply idealizations in general can be seen as, as processes that inform what key you use for a model. So that gives you that axis here. So when you have the piece, yes. One question is that do you, do you mean uh, litmus paper to be a model for acidity? Well, it's a, it's a representation. I mean, a, a litmus paper is a representation. It, it represents properties of the solution that you stick it in. But would it also be a model? No, I wouldn't want to call it. No, I wouldn't want to call it a model. Is there something that excludes it from being a model, given <coughs> definition? Um, yeah, there's no interpretation there. So, I mean, the litmus paper has, has a property that you key up, but that thing isn't mm. there. So, there is no interpretation like in the Phillips Newlin machine. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. But I think you, you're pointing to, a, to an important area because. The boundary between what's a model and what's not a model is quite fluid. So yeah. Yeah. But I think that there's an element of conventionality even, uh, in mm -hmm. exemplification because the user, uh, you know, Bas van Frassen insists in his theory of representation that uh, 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 a representation is always used by someone, a subject, uh, a human subject. So when there is an ex exemplification, you like uh, you're the color or the litmus the litmus paper, the user has to say yeah. uh, with the, with the context uh, uh, in which the user finds himself or herself has to make clear that you know, this is an exemplification. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with that. And von Frassen's Hauptsatz uh, of representation is something like there is no representation without the user. And yeah, I mean, I'm in complete agreement with that. I mean, I think Frosten and I have a sort of slightly different idea of what the representation in detail means. But on, on that, we completely agree, I think. Yeah. And then we have imputation here. And so we have the whole um, diagram. And now I've just made it a bit 
smaller to put my descriptions here. And that, that also relates to the point you just made. I mean, I, I want to be explicit that this is done in language. We talk about this. This is done by, by actors. So this is not a theory of representation. The representations somehow live <coughs> in the physical space by themselves. The representations is done by users. And now you see why it's the Decky account. That's just the acronym for the key ingredients, namely denotation, exemplification, keying up, and imputation. That's where this comes from. Now I want to give you a few corollaries. So we want to say that a representation is faithful if T indeed has the properties that the representation attributes to it or that imputes to it. Now that this is the case is not built into the account. The representation can be completely wrong. I mean, someone uh, may think that Margaret Thatcher wasn't brutal and ruthless at all, and the caricature completely misrepresents her. Still, the caricature does represent her as such. And that's really all that representation tells you, whether a, rep a representation is veridical or not. It's not part of the semantics of a, of a representation. But that's sort of a point that somehow often leads to confusion when people want to build more into an account of representation than should be in it. So that the representation is, is veridical, is not part of the representation itself. Just like sentences don't come sort of with the label on the sleeves and say, well, I'm true. <laughs> Uh, so, so that the objects have the properties that the representation ascribes to them is not part of the representation content. Corollary two, and I think that, that speaks to your question, so the scientific model is not a synonym for scientific representation. So not all models are representation of something, so some models can be just Z representation, so Michael Weisberg discusses this nice example of four sex populations. I think the three sex don't work anymore, they found some crazy creatures somewhere <laughs> that need Actually. three sexes, but for all I, I know at least, please correct me if biology have moved on, I'm, I'm not aware of any species in the world that have four sexes, but still they're four sex models. So these are, are models, clearly, but they're not models of something, and that's why I didn't want to de de define models such that they require a target system. And in, in the, in the DECI account, you have a nice explanation of that. You can say these models, they are Z-representations, so Weisberg's four-sex models, they are four-sex four model represent four, four <coughs> species representations, but they're not representations of such species. Like, vice versa, not all representations are models, they're graphs, diagrams, litmus paper, and so on. So I should say clearly that this project has no imperialist tendencies. I don't want to say that absolutely everything is a model. Uh, there is a conventionality, as you said, about what counts as a model or not. We can have a discussion about what convention we should adopt. What James and I want to make is just a conditional claim that if we have something we want to call a model and that something represents, then it does so in the sense of Decky. That's the claim we would want to make. Corollary three is the Decky account explains how learning from models takes place, which is a good maiden feature, I think. So you study the model, you see what's exemplified in a given context, then you ask what is the key that the model is based on, and then you know how you learn from a model. And finally, I want to emphasize that the Decky account operates as a certain level of generality. So we talk about objects, keys, exemplification. Obviously, that needs to be concretized in every particular instance. So this is not uh, an account that straightforwardly applies to every object that's a model, but you have to concretize it. So you have to say, what's the key? What's the exemplification relation, and and so on. Uh, excuse me, uh, but is, do you think your Dickey um, account of representation uh, a if and only if characterization of representations? I mean, if something is a representation if and only if it's a Dickey representation. Yeah, we would want to say that. So I, I know that is obviously a bold. Claim, but yes, yeah. we, we would want to 
say that at least when once we agreed what the model is, so and we say that the model rep is representational, then the model represents if and only if it satisfies the Decky conditions. Okay, but then I, I suppose in, in the properties, huh? mm. when you talk about properties, you, you, you take properties in a very general sense, you take into account also uh, relational properties. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah we are. Right. At this uh, point, we have yes. made no assumption about yeah, because what there are, there are, you know, many people who talk about representation, they talk about structure, you know, and the structure is probably, it's of course, captured by the notion of relation with properties, and then, the, okay. Well, no, no, so in, I a, know you know that in, a, in, a, in a longer version, I would specify, of the talk, but then I only have so much time, I would specify this further, but no, at this point, no assumption about the nature of properties is made it the, there can be monadic properties or polyadic properties. It's not even assumed that they're all independent, so these, there can be all kind of dependency relations between properties. So I take this, this comes back to the previous caveat, exactly one of the issues that has to be sorted out in particular cases. I don't believe that there is a one-size-fits-all account, so that's part of my beef with structuralism, that fits some cases nicely, but typically my colleagues in philosophy are I'm a biologist there at me in disbelief and I tell them about structural representation because I say, well, none of our models work in this way. And I take it as an advantage of this account that it can accommodate that. I mean, properties can be structural properties, nothing wrong with that. But it's not, it's, it's not committed to them being so. But I, I come to that also right now. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, some models are material objects like the Phillips Newley machine, but obviously not all. The Newtonian model of the solar system, you hold it in your head, not in your hands, the Bohr model of the atom, the Schilling model of social segregation, and so on and so on. So, what are we doing about these? I've just talked about material models so far. And I think the good news is that this entire scheme can remain in place. That's why I invested so much time into it. We just have to say something about what this object here is. And there are two schools of thought, but, but be, before we come to these, I said, let us reflect on what we actually want. Let's work it backwards. So we want that the objects, and I put them in scare quotes now because they are not objects of a physical kind, they must have properties that we can study. So, for instance, model planets must have certain features. They must be right and wrong in the models. The fact that something is not physical doesn't mean that it's arbitrary. So there must be claims that are correct in the model, there must be claims that are incorrect in the model. And we must have an epistemology for this. We must be able to find out, because if, if, if models, say, are sort of abstract objects we never have any access to, that's not helpful. So we need to have an epistemology for them. But these are the three conditions of adequacy for any ontology of model objects. <coughs> but there are at least two candidates here. So one school of thought thinks that models are fictional entities, something along the lines of Sherlock Holmes or Middle Earth, as Peter Godfrey Smith's favorite example is. The other school of thought says that models are mathematical objects, set theoretical structures, graph theoretical structures, or something of that sort. There's a lot to be said about this. I mean, I don't want to discuss this here, although I have a favorite here. Um, what matters for the current talk is that Decky is indifferent towards this choice. As far as the Decky account of representation is concerned, you can, you can uh, basically take your pick. Whatever choice you make depends on further philosophical commitments you have, but it doesn't depend on that account of representation. And you can then see these descriptions that I have put there as specifying these objects, either the mathematical objects or the fictional objects. And that's also one of the motivations to have the language always there. Now, with an eye on time, I skip some of the details here. You can ask me later about these if you want. And I just want to um, wrap up by saying I think this, this account gives you an account of representation both for, for material and non-material model. You just have to make a choice for what you think non-material models are, mathematical structure, fictional objects, or something else. 
this account doesn't care and it can deal with all of them. For instance, if you're a structuralist and you go back to this, you can say the object X is a mathematical structure, the mathematical structure becomes a model if you interpret it in one way or another. To take a mathematical equation, you can interpret one of the terms as a population density, for instance, it becomes a population model, and all the rest just runs as it did before. And I hope this is not just sort of consolation for the specialist, as Feyerabend once called it. So I hope that this has some upshots for scientific practice. And so I made my good modelers checklist here that practitioners could use. So <coughs> be clear on what your model entity X is and on what properties it has. Make sure your interpretation is unambiguous and explicit, so you have very clearly laid down what your interpretation is. Make sure it's clear what the target system is and what denotation of the target system means. If there's no target system, make that clear too. So not having a target doesn't disqualify what you do as non-modeling or the thing you study as is not deprived of the status of a model on this account. It's just a model that doesn't represent a particular target system. Say if the Guatemalans had never bought, bought that machine and this had all just been sitting around in the basements of the Bank of England and they had played around with it there a bit but never used it for, for actual policy setting in the United Kingdom, that still would be an economy representation and an economic model. It just would not be a representation of the UK e economy. And it's important to be clear on these things. Then regarding two and three, never confuse a Z representation with a representation of Z. That sounds trivial when put in the abstract, but the mistake is made. I mean, some of you may have read papers that claim that the world literally is a cellular automaton just because it's represented by a cellular automaton. Uh, that's exactly the sort of confusion they have in mind. Uh, a, a model can be based on the mathematical structure of a cellular automaton. That's great. But that doesn't mean the world is a cellular automaton. Not even if you want to say that this model is an accurate representation, which it may well be. But that doesn't mean that the, <laughs> that the world is just the same as the model object. Now, be explicit about the properties you take to be exemplifiers, and that's the point you highlighted. So not every property instantiated is also exemplified. It's highly contextual, so be careful what you take to be exemplified. Now, that is a crucial one. Spell out the key, at least in physics, but that's often left largely implicit. So the use of physical model is often not very well explained in that part. And the world is just somehow ha like the model, <laughs> then you leave it at that. So ideally, we really would want to know what the key is, because that is what generates your epistemic claim. Do you have some notion of idealization at work? Is it a certain, certain uh, approximation? Or what's going on here? And then say which properties are imputed to the target. There can be properties that are exemplified, but you don't want to impute them. You have this option. So say which ones you actually <coughs> impute, and then check the accuracy of the representation. And that's the thorny question of how truth or trust is, is established. And as I said before, the fact that a property pops out of the model doesn't mean that the target has the property. So that, that, that is just a mistake. Um, so we need to have one way or another to establish that the target really has that. The traditional method is, of course, just go to the laboratory and make a test. But in some cases, you may not be able to do that. If a climate model gives you a result for the levels of global warming in 2050, you can't just stick the global climate into the laboratory and see what happens in 2050. You need sort of other measures to uh, f come to a decision of what's trustworthy and what not. But a theory of representation has nothing to say about this. And I don't mean that this question is not important, it's extremely important. It is just a separate question. And sort of loading an account of representation with the demand of solving that question too just muddies the waters. 
in a way that we, we shouldn't. Okay, and on this note, I say thank you so much. So let's take five and return with the comment of Count Everyone.
Good. All right, let me just make sure we get the, the camera pointed at the other screen. So we don't normally have hybrid commentaries, but this is cool. This is, this is a, new, a new test. I like this. I'm happy to. Uh, so let us start the discussion with the comments of Quentin. Please, you have the floor. If there's a problem with the sound, I will tell you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is okay. So first, you so you presented this caricature of Margaret Thatcher. You say this is a representation of her as a boxer. And then you talked about the, I don't remember the name of the machine, the water pump machines, water pipes machines. And I was expecting you to say this is the representation of the economy as uh, water pipes. And I was surprised when you say no, it's an economy representation. So it's a representation of the economy as an economy. And so I was surprised and I'm wondering why would you need because you could have the why do you need this internal thing between Z Z and X and then the keys and it seems to me that there is some kind of redundancy and that you could get all the job that the interpretation does just by having the keys do the the relationship between the object and the target. Not so you would have a representation of the economy as a, uh, as a water pipes, and it has it exemplified property of having one liter of water, and this, and you have a key that translates one liter of water into a million dollar whatever. And so, so I just I was just a bit puzzled. And why do you? Why do you need the interpretation inside the language and then the keys, and why not just one kind of relation that is given by the keys? Well, that's the first question. I don't know if I do want to answer and then I Would you prefer to answer one, one after the other or both at the same time? Entirely up to you. Maybe you can also just I can't hear all the questions and then you. Please, please continue. Um, yeah, the microphone is muted. Yeah, but. The other one, no. Oh, no, but he can't. He in, in He's not connected to YouTube. Oh, okay, okay. I can't hear anything. Okay, just. I have to find where is my. Hello? One moment. Where is it? Wave at him so he knows one second. Yeah. <laughs> I think I sure don't know. Wait, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, please, uh, please ask all your questions first, please. Okay. Good. Then the second question. Is so. What's good about this account is that it's very liberal, so it can come for many kinds of representations. Uh, uh, but and so it made me think about. I, I guess you know this uh, this theory, which is very minimalist by uh, Calendar and Cohen, who say representation is just stipulation and. So it's a bit more sophisticated, so it doesn't have the same uh, problems of Canada and Cohen who say it's just stipulation. But I thought maybe it has one, it could have one problem in common. Maybe you have a solution, but there is a paper by uh, Bosch who criticized it for not taking into account the kind of communal aspects. So basically, uh, or to say it, maybe. It's Differently, uh, something can be taken to be a representation because of it seems that something could be a representation of something else because of nodes of use and not because some particular user uh, takes the model to be a representation. So, for example, I can have a map of a woman I know in my pocket and I'm not using it, I'm not taking anything of the map to be to represent. But then you could say, well, this is a map of not of another city because it's the normal use. It's kind of a community norm. And I don't know if you have something to say about community norms of representation, or if you, if you want to reduce everything to use particular users, particular uses. 
or I should think that there is another story to be told about Mars. So that's my two questions. Okay. Do you, do you want to, to project again? Uh, any questions? Not necessarily. Okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I may need to slide you again at some point. But it, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Quentin. These are really good questions, and thank you for drawing attention to these. Let me start with your first question. So you ask, why do I not just say that this is a representing the economy as, as a system of water pipes? Um, so in effect, you're asking, what is the Z here? So, so why did I not say this is um, just a water pipe representation? Well, the point is if you really it comes out out of an analysis of how these models works in work in, in practice if you talk to economists what they really do is they say well this is a Keynesian economy because what is enshrined in the way the flows work at the system is set up is effectively the principles of Keynesian e economics well in in the Hicks version but so you short changing what the model does if you say, well, that this is just uh, pipes where water flows. And so it's really important to have that mechanism in place. And if you spell that out in detail, what <coughs> one should really say is that this is a water pipe system that is a Keynesian economy representation, all hyphenated, so that's a Z, and it represents the, say Guatemalan economy as a Keynesian economy and well one this is important for the practice of how these things are used and another is also for our understanding of targetless models I think it's important to me that I think I've emphasized that numerous times during the talk that we're not making the representation of an actual target in any way a condition for being either a representation or a model. And so, as I mentioned that in the talk, even if the Guatemalans had never used the model in this way, it would still be an economy representation, but it wouldn't be an economy, it wouldn't be a representation of any particular economy. And that point becomes impossible to make if you lump the key and the interpretation into one. Because if you don't have these as separate steps and you don't have a target system, uh, there's nothing to key properties up with. And then suddenly you're, you, you're there with, with that water thing, but no actual target to which it, it relates. And then uh, you don't really know how to do the semantics anymore. So keeping the interpretation and the keying up separate helps you solve this problem but I do accept that this introduces a little bit of a tension with the heuristic examples of the caricature at the beginning where you don't really have that separation very clearly but that is also because you don't really have an account of what the Z representation is explicitly in there you just look at the caricature and say ah it looks like a box now if you if you insert in a proper account of Z representation there, for instance, take the seeing in account that's associated with Gombrich or Lopez or Wolheim, you would say, well, this is, a, is an array of lines on paper that is such that an uh, informed spectator would see a boxer in it, and um, the boxer is then keyed up with a particular subject in one way or another. So that would make this two-step process more, more visible. But I definitely think in the scientific case, it's worth having both to make sense of targetless models and to do justice to scientific practice. And, and if I maybe can, ask, can add another example here, the one that I had on the slides that I skipped over at, at the end because I wanted to leave time for discussion is so to take the Newtonian model of the solar system. The model itself is, is an imaginary model. It's a big sphere and it's a small sphere that are placed 
in otherwise empty space, and the interaction is just gravity between them. That becomes a, a solar system model, or rather a Sun-Earth system model, only once you say the big sphere is interpreted as the Sun and the small sphere is interpreted as the Earth. There's nothing intrinsic in two spheres that tells them that to be Sun and Earth. And you could make another choice here. You could be Niels Bohr and say, ah, the big sphere is the proton and the small sphere is the electron. And then the exactly same model object becomes a different model because it has a different interpretation. And again, it helps to have interpretations here because it tells you what the representational content of the model is as understood as a set representation. Now, I, I, I hope that answers the first question. Now, the second question was about community norms of what represents what, or is it just an individual voluntaristic act? I think this is a very good question, and this is something I see very much as space for further work in the Deki account. We have been talking very much in sort of a user centered way, someone takes something to represent something else, and that's often how it happens. And at some point Newton said, let's take these two spheres and let them represent the sun and the earth. Um, that does not imply that all representation always works in this way, and that doesn't mean that there are no community norms. There could of course be community norms that regiment things in one way or another and sometimes one is even caught in the, in the middle between these things there is a norm that would suggest that you should, should use a model in a particular way but then you want to use it in a, in a, in a different way an example here is, is um, epidemiological models that tell you how diseases spread they obviously come out of medicine, but they have recently been used by uh, um, the police in crime fighting. They sort of they've torn these models out of the epidemiological context and say, we're now seeing not how a virus spreads, but how crime spreads. And so that's something where you had a community norm, but then the community norm was changed by force, as it were, by tearing the model out of the context. And I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting things to be said about how this works and what happens in such cases. I don't think the Decky account as formulated gives you any of this, so it is just silent about it. But I don't think these considerations in any way stand in tension or contradiction with the account. I mean, this is just something that could could be inserted into it and could be used to complement the account in this way and I think this would be an interesting thing to do. Thank you. Quentin, do you have uh, some further questions? Uh, just a bit, uh, some more, I will ask some more precision uh, about my first question. Uh, so what difference do you, do you make between so that the, the water pumps, do they it's exemplify uh, having a one million dollar say in the in the, I don't know in that place? And then what difference is it, is there between the color? Because the map exemplifies having the color, but in this case the color is not imputed. So I'm a bit confused about the difference between the two cases. Why is the color exemplified but not having more data either? Why is it exemplified? Or um, the color is a property that you put into the key and that is then keyed up. I mean you I mean, as you said at the beginning of your comment, the account is relatively liberal in that it allows you to do a number of things. I mean, maybe you would want to analyze, you could give an alternative interpretation of the map. You could say the map, um, so I exemplifies um, 
being 600 meter above sea levels by being, le by being yellow and then that is imputed to the target with a certain precision key, uh, probably plus minus 50 meter because the city is sort of hilly. <laughs> I mean, I'd be happy with that. I mean, I don't think there's a problem. It just depends how you want to apply the account to a, to a particular case. I think you're right in pointing out that there is leeway here, but I, I think the account can, can accommodate both, both uses. Um, sorry I'm turning my, my, my back to you, but it's sort of a strange setup to actually see you. <laughs> I have to turn my back to the camera. So. Yeah, I see myself. I see <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Let's not let's now return to the general discussion. People online can write their question in the comment. There will be a little bit of delay, <coughs> I understand, but we will come to your question. Just first, maybe you want to return to your slides. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, questions first, uh, Michel. Okay, thank you very much. This is a very stimulating talk. I'm very uh, interested in the representation. So, um, <clears throat> I have several questions, but uh, I think it, I, I tend to make, in my view on representation, uh, a rather sharp distinction between on the one hand, the uh, representing artifact, okay, mm -hmm. the 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 X, the X in your terminology. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, and on the other hand, <coughs> propositions, propositions. Um, I I I think that uh, representing artifacts are not propositions. They are not propositions. Of course, I. Some representing artifacts can be called faithful, correct, or even true, but only in a derivative way. Mm -hmm. It's because the imputation, I think that's a nice word, the imputation uh, uh, by the model of some properties to the target huh, is relies on propositions, true propositions. Uh, for Why a, true? Yeah. Uh, two propositions because if you if you want to a uh, representation that is I mean representation uh, representing artifact to be successful mm -hmm. in the first place that is to be able to identify the target it is about and second that's the first thing and the second thing is well is it is the representation I mean the representing artifact is it correct or uh, accurate uh, or is it faithful because in order to uh, to to make the representing artifact to be a representation of a specific target it must be true for example taking the example of the uh, uh, economy of Guatemala that there is a banking system in Guatemala or there is a woman called Margaret Thatcher uh, who has uh, uh, some face, you know, but that one is somehow similar to the one which is uh, mm -hmm. on the representing artifact. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, you need to, to rely on true propositions to be able to say that, for example, Margaret Thatcher is represented as a boxer or rather as someone who is a hard puncher. You know, she's not a boxer, you know, in the context. Uh, I think that, that's the the point of interpretation in this, uh, in this example. So, <coughs> there cannot be a, a successful representation or, and further a correct representation or true representation, and I don't want to be picky about words here, unless you, you suppose that some propositions are true. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that's, that's an important distinction, you know. It's, it's, it's something that uh, seems to me that you, 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 you don't make uh, clearly enough, well, at least to me, in your, in your, in your account. 
Okay, yeah, thank you. Look, I, I think there's at least two aspects to what you're saying. This account presupposes that you have means of target identification that are not reliant on the model itself. And I have said nothing about this here. So I think this is also something one has to say more. So we have to be able to identify the target prior to having the model in place. And this is because I don't believe in this sort of magnet theory <laughs> of representation where the model represents whatever is somehow structurally isomorphic to it. I think this is sort of getting things, sure, things upside down. Yeah. So, and I agree. As you, as you say, you need propositions, that's right. So that's why I have a description of the target where we can identify the target. There's a good question about how this works and I haven't said anything about it. I I accept that, so that, yeah. that, that stands outside. And I think the, 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 the key issue here about identifying a, guard, a target which is susceptible to be uh, uh, represented, you, you have to do some kind of abstraction. You didn't mention abstraction, but you abstract some properties of the target and then you make those properties by what you call the key and correspond to some properties of the, of the representing artifact, it seems to me. Yeah, that's a separate step. I mean, I think we can identify a target through a pointing, for instance. I could just point to the sky and say, the sun. So I don't have to abstract anything, but I have to have the means of identifying the sun somehow. And th these means of identification get more tricky when you get to things you can't observe directly, like micro or macro entities. Um, so there's a lot to be said there. But th I don't think that step involves any abstraction or anything like that. This is just identifying the object. The abstraction comes in when you choose a, what do you call the representing artifact. Um, there's nothing in the sun and the earth that forces you to represent it as perfect spheres. I mean, that's yeah. a great model, but you can have a different model. I mean, Kepler had another model famously. Um, so this is sort of the creativity of the scientist who comes up with a particular model object or take the Schelling model of social segregation. Yeah. I mean, it's a genius idea to take a checkerboard and sort of a dynamic on a checkerboard, but there's nothing in social segregation that forces this on you. And obviously you can then use these as models only if you can tell a plausible story about what properties they exemplify and how they are imputed, but what account you give depends on what you choose as a model object, and that's where abstraction and so on comes into play. Now, for the second kind of proposition, I see models as generating proposition because what, sort of in a sense, you can see this whole diagram as encoding. Uh, property attribution, namely target T has property Q. So that's the claim that the model generates. I don't think the model itself is, is, is with proposition. But the model generates a proposition namely <coughs> T has property Q. But I would not say that this proposition must be true. This proposition can be true or false. Um, that's an empirical question, which is the case. So, but you, you, look, you know, when if you want to make a model of a specific object, like take mm -hmm. the proton or the or the atom, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, you cannot point to the atom. But what you do then? Well, uh, I suppose, I suppose mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the proton has a mass, the electron mm -hmm. has a charge, uh, rather in this case. The ball model has a charge, the electron has a charge, and they are, you know, they have properties of motion. And this is a way to identify the target. Okay. Now, whether the atom is truly, is truly a, a, a planetary system in some sense or something like that, that you can, you know, put into into brackets. But there is a way to to identify, you know, the target. And then what, what you do is you attribute properties you know, to the target, and then you make statements, uh, and then th that is uh, which correspond to propositions. And I think that's the, the basis, you know, uh, the start of you know of any representation. Yeah, yeah, I I I, I completely mm -hmm. agree with that. The, yeah. the, the the point I'm making is just that 
the propositions that you make that are true and that you start with, as you say, they stand outside the model. They are pre-model, as it were. They are in the background series. I also saw something I didn't talk about, but I, 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 I don't think that models live, live in the vacuum. So, so with sometimes this model literature has gone overboard a little bit by thinking that, well, everything's a model. So I think models work against a the theoretical background. And we need that theoretical background to make the model work. For instance, by saying we identify the protons through a certain mass, through a certain charge, maybe through a certain spin. And so we say, well, the proton is just the thing that has these properties. And then we can model it and say it consists of quarks and uh, whatever else you want to say about it. Um, so, oh yes, so, um, I think we're in agreement here. This is just a part of a theory representation that I haven't okay. talked about today. Kevin? Okay. Thank you very much for this talk. I agree with you that uh, most of the time the nature of models uh, is not about the talk, but the issue with theories. I was wondering how theories enter into these seconds. Are, are they there to define the Z representations of properties and how they work? And uh, what's the relation between theories and your pattern of model? And another question that I have if models are not always representation of something, right, if there is no target, but you still learn something from the model, what do you learn about with your models? So, so what do I? What do you learn about with your models if there is no target of implementation of my model? Okay. Um, let me do the last question first, because that's probably quicker. <laughs> so, well, what do I learn in a representation that's not a representation of? But, well, I, I learn about how the model objects behave. So, if you study the force X population and you stipulate certain properties for the force X population, I just learn how that force X population behaves, how fast uh, it can grow or how fast it shrinks and you basically learn how your model objects behave. How useful that is depends on what you want to do. <laughs> uh, so if you're not interested in full sex populations it tells you very little. But So you will just learn how the objects in the model behave and that is often extremely useful. I mean, so that's probably more your speciality than than mine, Alexander, but if you look at early quantum field theory, for instance, the so-called phi-4 model, it was known very, very quickly that this model doesn't describe real particles. There are no young mass particles. Um, but the model was studied extensively because the techniques you can use in this model were very, very useful. So physicists learned how the thing behaves on the renormalization, they learned about symmetry breaking, they learned about all kinds of things in that simple setting of the Phi 4 model. And if you're interested in these things, that's a real treasure trove. If not, <laughs> you just would move on. So, in brief, you learn how the objects behave. And in doing so, you learn about the concepts you're using. Because you, 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 you're learning how your conceptual scheme plays out in certain scenarios, so that is extremely important. Now, where do theories fit in here? Um, again, a lot can be said about this, but often this goes into the specification of the model object. I mean, I'm sort of cutting a long story short. If I say the Newtonian model is two perfect spheres in empty space, that by itself doesn't give you anything, nothing follows from that. <laughs> so you have to have two, two perfect spheres that attract each other gravitationally, or at least with a 1 over r square law, and they follow Newton's equation. So often to specify what the x is in this theory, in particular with non-material models, you need theories, because the theories tell you how the objects behave, what is the time evolution, and that is one of the key points where theories enter. And that's also where theories and models work in, in, in tandem. I mean, Newtonian theory doesn't tell you, 
much about planetary motion by itself. You have to sort of feed that model into it. But then the model by itself doesn't tell you anything either. So, so you need both of them. And so if, if you specify what the model object is, almost invariably some theory will enter there. There may be further theory entries when you want to spell out what, what the key is and, and things, things like that. But I mean, in the, the most important point of theory entry here is the specification of the model object. So there is a uh, under relation of denotation, not under relation of interpretation or the Z representations? Um, I, I would say series first and foremost live inside this object here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Newtonian theory doesn't tell you you have to interpret the big thing as the sun. Yeah. It's just a big ball that moves in a particular way. So the interpretation here is not determined by Newtonian theory, nor what, what, what is exemplified. But without Newtonian theory in here, I mean, nothing here follows. So, so I would say that. And, um, and different models work in different ways. This is often this question that, that I'm asked. So, so how do models and theory relate? And my answer to that question is that it's the wrong question, in the sense that there's no one relation that models and theories have to each other. There are many relations that models and theories can have. And you have sort of very theory-driven models, like Newton's model on one side, and you have practically independent models like the Lord Comaltera model on the other, which doesn't have any biological theory in it. It has some general mathematics in it, but not, not anything that biologists would recognize as a biological theory. There's basically everything in between. So there is a sliding scale of degrees of theory dependence in models, and that obviously has a lot to do with how you specify these things. Channel. Yeah, this was this is this is this is great stuff. I, I, I really like this approach. I wanted to push on a gray area that you mentioned near the end of the talk, which is uh, sort of between representations that are serving as mere representations and representations that are serving as models. Mm -hmm. uh, because on the one hand, and I guess I, I, I can actually ask this pretty pretty rapidly. I share your intuition, and I, because I'm actually playing with it in another context for, for on a project right now, an object that seems to sort of inhabit a gray zone where it's sort of unclear how it's being used in practice, whether it's being used in such a way as to be a, a mere representation or a proper model. But then on the other hand, when I look at the account, the full account, there's a lot going. This account is so heavyweight that it makes it seem as though it would be difficult for there to be a gray area between things that are used as mere representations and things that are used as models. Because it, something's being used as a model implies a lot of moving parts that we ought to be able to detect in the scientific practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder what you think about these cases. Like, how do we make how do we make sense for? You mentioned a bit of like almost a bit of conventionality in whether we decide to sort of. To, take a representation as a model or take it as merely reference, merely a sort of cute representational device. Um, how's, how, is this, how is this going to work and how do you, maybe a, a related question, how do you, when you go to apply this account in a new domain of scientific practice, how do you go about finding the parts in the practice of what the scientists are up to to see how, to see how the account maps onto what they're doing? Okay, first, so where, where do we draw the line? I mean, as I mentioned, I think there's a degree of conventionality in this. But I would say, just if you look at the scientific practice, you would call something a model if it is an object in a certain sense that has sort of an, an internal life. It has a dynamics. You see how it evolves. It does something. <laughs> either physically on the table or in the, in the fictional world of the model, that you can actually study something unfolds in it. Uh, I think that is a defining feature of a model. And if something doesn't have that, it's, it's hard to call it a model. 
Um, and then it's the aspect of there being an, an interpretation. So you have model objects, or sort of the artifacts that are used representationally, and you interpret them in a particular way. So you interpret spheres as planets, or if you're more on the structuralist side, you inter interpret certain terms of an equation as particles. <coughs> So that's interesting because the, the equation has certain properties and if you think about sort of the imaginary scenario that's portrayed through these equations, there's something happening in them. And I think that is really something that is a defining feature for model. Now let me be clear, this is a pragmatic feature. I mean I extract this from how scientists speak, from how we how we want to carve this up. I mean, there's nothing semantic in this, so there's nothing sort of that has any philosophical necessity, but sort of that is sort of a feature that makes a model a model is you can watch what it does and how it behaves. <laughs> and, and you can find out about how it behaves. I mean, take a Poincaré's three body problem. There's a model with three bodies and Bunker has spent immense amount of time studying what it does. And you find out something about the model. Um, so you have to be able to, to look at the object in this way and it must do something. <laughs> and you, you, you can, with the focus speaking, watch what, what it does. And I, I think that is a crucial aspect of us calling something a, a model. Now, how would I go about identifying that in scientific practice? I think there's no silver bullet. It's just case by case. I mean, if I have to do this in a new field, I just go out and read a textbook or two or three and talk to talk to practitioners, read research paper, try to find out what the basic objects are, um, try to figure out what it does. And sometimes you you find out that well, they may, maybe they're actually not really modeling at all. Maybe they just give descriptions of what's, what, what, what's going on. And um, that's fine. I mean, and that's for probably the last question, how do you deal with other things? So here we have a model that does the representing. A controversial claim that they would make and they would be refuted if uh, that's wrong, is that this account applies beyond models. So you could put an image here. So you can you can put the microscope image here. So you take take the model out, forget about all this, just replace this box, say with the microscope image. Uh, that the microscope image has all kind of properties, but it doesn't exemplify the so you be selective. You key that up, you impute I think at least some visual representations of the science work in exactly the same way. It's an interesting case study to be mainstream, by the way. So we had all these stories about the black holes that have, have been pictured, sort of what the Harvard group does, and the Peter Gallison has been involved in this crucially. So you get these, these wonderful images. But I mean, you're not just seeing a black hole the way you're seeing a football. So there's a lot going on there. So you put that image in, so you have to spell out very carefully what properties that image actually exemplifies. There's a story about um, colors to be told as well, which is that they use actually completely conventional color, color coding. So what is exemplified, what is imputed, and thinking about these images in this way, I, I would submit actually helps understand how these images work. That's cool. Um, Peter? Yeah, thanks a lot for this great talk. And, uh, and, uh, ask, your, ask your question uh, strong enough because sometimes people on the internet they don't hear well questions. Okay, that are well, I can come a bit closer to so, uh, you. Yeah. So, um, thank you for coming. So, so thanks a lot for, uh, I think it goes. No, it's good. You're okay, good okay. But thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, so, so this, 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 this is very appealing, um, but I was, I was a bit, um, well maybe my question has some Meinungian uh, undertones and I hope it's interesting beyond, uh, 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 um. so I was a bit surprised with your sort of quite almost actualistic or realist uh, 
idea of well the unicorn uh, is not a representation of the unicorn and uh, the four sex population mm -hmm. is not what is represented uh, um, but but I mean this seems to be very interesting representations of, of, of completely fictional or possible objects or even impossible objects uh, um, and there are still representations of that object, even though it is not has no physical existence. Um, and, and think of mathematics, uh, like of course mathematics itself could maybe be a model, or you can have mathematical models, of course. But um, like a square can like be a representation. Well, a square is not a very interesting model, but um, like there is complex mathematics that is represented by very simple stuff. Uh, so as mathematical objects that are represented and are modeled, I guess. Um, um, I could imagine a model of uh, what's the name of the Harry Potter sports Quidditch or something. Quidditch. Yeah, Quidditch. Uh, Quidditch so, some some complex uh, fictional uh, stuff mm -hmm. that has been described, but but just in words, and you want to get a better model of it. You want to like describe how it can have behaved, um, supposing like Harry Potter world would uh, be coherent. Sort of, uh, um, so, but, 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 but the, the, the main question is what, why you want, want to stress that it's actually physical existence. I mean, I don't know what better about the physicality mm -hmm. of it, but like actually <coughs> existing stuff that can be modeled. Why not abstract object or even impossible object or something like that? Fiction. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're right to say that I have some sort of actualist bias, <laughs> but I think for the representation account, actually, nothing much hangs on it. No, so, that, that's what I uh, so what appeared to me. Yeah, I just took it to be a datum of scientific practice that things that we take not to exist are somehow the subject matter of models like four sex populations or young males particles or things like that. Now, if you want to turn around and say, no, they actually exist. They're just sort of minorian objects. <laughs> well, they, they don't really exist. They are, according to um, They then, might come into existence, <coughs> and that's why it might be scientifically yeah. interesting. <coughs> I, I mean, in... in in, in the DECI scheme, you just would reclassify them then. Sort of say a four sex population representation would then also be a representation of a four sex population if you think the four sex population exists. Mm -hmm. um, so that depends on your, on your metaphysics. And if you have a, a sort of a richer ontology than I presupposing. I don't think anything in the deck yet that's what stops you from using it in this way. If you think the Golden Mountain exists and you have a model of the Golden Mountain, then it's a model of the Golden Mountain. That right. That's, I think by the lines of Decky, that's fine. So the, the, the metaphysics of what exists and what doesn't stands outside it. So if I just wanted to make room for non-existence in the sense that at least one might want to have the option of talking about representations in the case of objects that don't exist. So you don't want to commit yourself to objects existing just because they appear in the model. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. so, um, so, so it's, it's more sort of um, creating space. Right. And obviously things can be reclassified, and I mean that also often happens in the history of science. Take the Dirac sea of electrodes, for instance, and Dirac had these negative energy solutions to his equation, and first just threw them away as sort of mathematical artifacts, and then suddenly they got reclassified as uh, positrons. Uh, so suddenly what, 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 what looked like something that is just in the wall was, was real. And sort of the account is flexible to to make sense of 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 that. that you, you can have your own have your own ontology combined with it. Yes. Question online? 
So maybe it's my turn. Yes, <laughs> it is. Uh, when you described a good modeler, yeah. I thought you were excessively you you you, you ask too much because mm -hmm. there's good scientific representation where some parts of this diagrams is opaque. Mm -hmm. Let's see the example, but. Uh, there's the philosopher of biology and medicine will correct me. An animal model to, to study some kind of physiological process. You don't master well the key, necessarily. You, the exemplification is partial, let's say. However, you have good reason to use this model. Some evolutionary history, the mouse is not that far from us, so it's not that bad to circulate. So, is it bad modeling? Or is it maybe it's not a model at all in the according to the key? I don't know. Yeah, look, I would have to look at the cases, but it, at least in the cases I'm familiar with, there is a degree of hand waving going on because the, the key is often not spelled out, mm -hmm. but it's assumed to be in the background. Yeah. And this is a plea to be explicit. Of course, we acknowledge that not the whole model may be keyed up, maybe there is an uncertainty to it, maybe this bandwidth, as it were. Uh, that's fine, nothing in the key says it has to be precise, it has to be complete. It, has to be. it is just a plea for saying something about how you think that the properties in the model relate to the properties in the, in the world beyond the way well, the world is, in one way, <laughs> was or another like the model. And I think that is what we should demand of models. And think back to the beginning of um, COVID, when we had all these COVID models that said all kinds of things about multiplication numbers and uh, how the infection grows and there were orders of magnitude apart. And each group said, well, no, the pandemic just behaves like our model. Uh, and then you're staring at each other. So if, I think this is very unsatisfactory. If they had said, the key is just one of tendencies, say, we take this model to say that the pandemic will, will, will increase, or, or infection numbers will increase, but we don't know by how much. That would have been extremely helpful, and that's a key, just saying we take the sign of the change as the properties we impute, but not the actual magnitude. And I think it's not enough to demand that, and I think that's an integral part of the epistemology of models. And that scheme is liberal in the sense that basically any relation you can specify somehow qualifies as a key, there's no sort of threshold that you have to you have to pass. But if you really can't say how you think the model relates to the world, then you have an incomplete representation. You still have a model in this view, but you have an incomplete representation. Does that still sound too demanding? Yeah. Incomplete in what sense? Okay. I, I I understand the argument about the key, even for the mouse representing some mm -hmm. model of human process. Yeah. The key, the, you have to say something about the key, of course, because, mm -hmm. but the exemplify, the end, you're not exactly sure what are the exemplified properties. It's not, it's not that easy. It's, you have good reason to use this model because you would say, they, they are close in the evolutionary tree, so maybe it's good. It, it's a good test model, good, but but it will always be incomplete. Except if you have a complete understanding of the process you want to understand. Okay, look, it's about asking completeness. No, no, no. I'm not asking completeness. I ask for specificity. Okay. So this can change all the time. You can change your model object, you can change what you take to be exemplified, you can, this can evolve in time. And there's nothing wrong with changing a model and changing its understanding and changing its, what you take to be exemplified. Well, this is totally fine. I just think at, at any given instant of time, 
a modeler must be able to say, now, given what we know, we take this and this and this to be exemplified. And this and this, we don't take to be exemplified. And that's how we key it up. And that's currently where we stand. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind in the light of better any evidence or further insights. Okay. But so, so what I think we cannot do is remain woolly about it. Okay. Uh, so, so, so that's really what, what I think matters. It's not that you nail it down once and for all, but that at any time you can be specific about that. Peter? Um, yeah, this might be a kind of a far-fetched question, and I'm already apologizing. I don't know whether I will make the idea very clear, but um, I was wondering whether um, you always have this sort of direct denotation, like non-descriptivist, I guess, that that's like the object is there, and, and it's just like the model is, is then independently of that uh, uh, constructed, right? Um, but it seems in science often we know the existence of the model or we know we can refer to it via the models we've developed. Um, so there may be, if we talk about some black hole or something, I don't know enough about cosmology, but uh, some, some black hole very far away, I mean, it, it, we, can, we can make maybe make a model of that, uh, of that black hole, but it's always through the the bigger model uh, that is our view of cosmology at, at some point. Um, maybe it's not the best example, but the, the, the feeling that, that we can some, sometimes identify something by its place in the way the model describes the world or something like that. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't call this the model. I think, uh, as I said before, I think models work in the context of background theories. And background theories often help you identify, mm -hmm. identify objects. And theories are complex constructs that have various layers. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing simple there. But the, a model of this view is a relatively local, a relatively narrow thing. It's a particular object that's interpret in a particular way. Now, that cannot identify its own target, I think. Um, so, otherwise, you get in this vicious circle uh, that, well, this model refers to whatever is similar enough to what the model is. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that helps you much. It becomes almost circular. So, you... Yeah, not necessarily. At least to make empirical. Circular. Claims. I mean, obviously, mathematical sciences this may be different, but if you do physics or biology, you have to be able to point out what your target system is. And that, that identification has to be independent of the particular model you're going to use to model its, its properties. Maybe you could associate it with some observations that make it like um, operational? Even though you cannot really, like ontologically, point at something, but then maybe you're modeling the observations rather than some object. I'm not sure. So I uh, might debate that. I mean, radical empiricists would think all models are just about phenomena, not about right. observable objects. Um, but I mean, cosmology is a good example in that sense because. Just the fact that there is a model that has a black hole in it doesn't lead cosmologists to believe in the reality of black holes. There is an awful lot around it that has to do, to do with, with empirical observations, with measurements, with what your telescopes tell you, and so on. And so all that is part of identifying the target. I, I think that is that is crucial. I mean, if someone just comes up with a model, that, that wouldn't be seen as establishing the existence of, of an astronomical object. I mean, how this is done is highly non-trivial, and I mean, as I said, I 
band up some more. I haven't said anything about it. So I think this gets us into the whole scientific realism debate and it's how you <laughs> identify your entities and all that and things that get very complicated and obviously <coughs> this account doesn't solve these these this problem with a magic wand. <laughs> but I think to meaningfully model you must be able to identify the target independently of your, of, of your model. I mean, otherwise you can't really generate interesting empirical claims. Or, or at least that, that's a claim I am, I am committed to. So uh, I mean, if, if I'm wrong on that. But, but that, that's interesting because you're asking to the background theory to do a lot of stuff that clearly your approach is not able to, at yeah. least this, this, this approach. Yeah. But on the other hand, now I realize that you cannot defend the semantic view. So you cannot define that the background theory is just a collection of models, yeah. something else. No, okay. I, I don't believe in the semantic Okay, theory. but that's another, <laughs> it's another interesting discussion. But it's I didn't want to It's a little bit, that, bit late, see, because now, 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 also now, yeah. now I want to know what is a background theory for you. But that's why I also mm -hmm. have all these linguistic things here, mm -hmm. which obviously the semantic view of theory would get nervous about. So thank no, you. No, no, no. So. so so once again, I mean, this is not an imperialist project. I don't think this is all the philosophy of science encapsulated, mm -hmm. that this account doesn't do do everything you want to do. It is just an account of how models represent. And there's many other important problems. And um, so I'm I'm generally skeptical. Accounts are presented and sort of, you know, sort of cut the board in knots, and suddenly all problems are solved. I mean, I don't want to promise anything like this. So it's, a, it's a localized account. I, I hope it does what, this, what it is designed to do, but it doesn't work in isolation and it doesn't solve every problem in philosophy of science. On this humble note. <laughs>